So just four months before Lenny, Jenny Hitsky uh, received the diagnosis and said those memorable words, <laughs> uh, I had a slight pain in my stomach. And my doctor said after a scan, run to the ER, it's a, a acute appendicitis. So I was dragging my feet because I was mowing the lawn, I was cycling, I was sort of pain was not too much. Uh, so and then it was the end of the spring semester, and uh, it was the following week I was going to the social linguistics symposium in Finland. And thereafter I had uh, invitations to speak in Colombia, Mexico, uh, Taiwan. So I wasn't too happy. But then I met a friendly colorectal surgeon in Kershey, which is a teaching hospital, part of Penn State, is two hours away from my town. Uh, he said, hey, just come over, I'll do a quick laparoscopic surgery for you, and you can go home the next day and go to Finland the following week. So I said goodbye to my family. I said, I'll be back, I uh, drove up there. Uh, he did the surgery, said, uh, stay overnight, uh, and if you, can do the, if you can do the three keys, I'll let you go tomorrow. And the three keys are, passing gas, peeing, and pooping. <laughs> so the next day he comes around, uh, comes on his rounds at 5 o'clock and pressed to leave. And I recounted all the wonderful things I had achieved in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> then he holds his hand like this, which uh, he was going to do for many, many months after that. And that was always a sign you know, of something going on. And he said, you know, I sent your appendix to pathology. Uh, they usually take five days for a formal report, but in your case, they call me within 24 hours. Uh, you have a cancerous tumor uh, in your appendix. Uh, and uh, then there was a white uh, chalkboard in that uh, room where I was staying. He wrote down three forms of appendiceal cancer. I don't remember any of those names. <laughs> and then uh, the, how the mind particular appendiceal cancer is a very aggressive one and the treatments he was going to do. Uh, I forgot, I, you know, I don't remember any of those things except for these words. He said, go on extended disability leave. Tell your head of department you're not going to teach this fall. Cancel all your trips. You need to get working quickly. So, that's first, the first time anybody had used the word disability to much of me. And uh, sure enough, as the treatment progressed, I became more and more impaired. So a month later, on my wedding anniversary, July 16, uh, they had an eight-hour surgery. And uh, they uh, removed the right side colon, right hemiglectomy, they call it, that's what I remember. And they found that the cancer had spread to the small intestines, and they took 18 inches of small intestines up. And because of the surgery of the bowel resection, uh, for four more times I had to go to the hospital because I was not doing well on the three P's. They told me yeah. And they gave me a diagnosis of uh, stage three cancer, and uh, they said I had to do chemotherapy for six months. And because of that, I developed peripheral neuropathy. And uh, when I try to highlight, you see my hands shaking. It's not because I'm scared. I get it. <laughs> It's because of my peripheral neuropathy. So, I think uh, I'm handling the physical issues fairly well. You can see me live and cold here. But uh, it's the talk about disability and cancer that I find challenging because it's constructing an identity for me that I always struggle with. So, uh, when I returned from the hospital, uh, a lot of my international students, especially the East Asian ones, they were very paternal about me. They wanted to protect me and, you know, make me feel nice. So, especially the Chinese students, they said, uh, Professor Kangaraja, uh, you shouldn't eat candy because it's sugar that causes cancer. <laughs> <laughs> and the others who said, Professor Kangaraja, you're working too hard, you need to sleep well. <laughs> and there are others who said, no, Professor Kangaraja, it's not about you. Somebody in your family had cancer. It's all about genetics. My answer for all three suggestions is a firm no. No one in my family that I can remember has had cancer. I ate candy. <laughs> I sleep extremely well, like a baby. But uh, I started feeling guilty and started doing internet research because I was wondering, what did I do wrong to deserve this disease? Somebody found my digital footprints and they wanted to help me unasked, uninvited. So soon one day, I had a dozen emails like this. Basically, they wanted to make, wanted me to make an informed decision uh, whether I wanted cremation or burial. <laughs> but there were others who were even more careful. They thought, without big cash, you can't make this decision. 
So they write the method that's an email to make a selenium insurance. So, there you go. so imagine waking up every day, even now, and opening your inbox and seeing 12 messages like this. Whatever, who is sending is saying, Dude, you're still there? What's wrong with you? You sent it like five years ago. <laughs> so, uh, uh, for a few days, I sat looking at the screen in my house, I mean, the, the ceiling in my hospital, mopping at the ceiling and uh, planning my funeral. But then I got bored. Then I got bored. Uh, that's when I remembered I had sent an article to the Journal of Second Hand Writing, and they had sent me three challenging reviews. And then earlier, I think it was a, 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 a appendix surgery, I had thought I'd go to the hospital and come back and start the revisions. But it now it looked like my life was rocking to revolve around hospitals. So I said, I need to get started. And I was going to do it. So, you can see the small print here. The article was published. And what it says is, uh, revisions received, you see my hands shaking, right? Uh, revisions received, 1st September 2014. What's interesting is, it was July 16, 2014, that I had the major surgery about this. I'm surprised that I could do so much work and I always ask myself, how did I manage the revisions? So I think this is what happened. Uh, I had uh, stitches or sutures all over my body, I couldn't move. That's when I re uh, realized what a great invention the 10-inch Dell mini computer is. I had never used it, Penn State didn't give it to me. It was lying in my home, but now on my bed, I could keep it with me, it's connected in the internet. I could call up all the uh, revisions through the web, I mean, the preview comments, start working on the revisions, and, and uh, write. But I would make other adjustments because they gave me, gave me oxycodone for pain management, and that would make me a zombie. I can't work with that. So I found that if I listen carefully to my body, there were particular postures, there are items, uh, feel the pain. It was in the night time that I felt the pain a lot uh, because um, I would twist and turn and hurt myself. So I started playing a game with my nurses. They would come in the morning and say, what's your pain level? One to 10. And I say, two, three. They say, no oxycodone for you today. <laughs> so I say, thank you, and start to get the revisions. Then the night time they come, and I say, nine, 10. <laughs> they give you a good dose of oxycodone. I fall asleep and wake up next time to work. So I started reconfiguring my environment to my advantage. Well, uh, contrary to what the doctors told me, I didn't tell the head of the department I was not going to teach in fall semester. And how I managed uh, the keyboard was uh, I scheduled it on Thursdays. I had to be in the hospital for like six uh, hours with one drug. And then they sent me back home with another drug, which has to be with me for two days. On Sunday, they removed the drugs, uh, you know, they uh, unplugged me. And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I teach. I never missed a single class. Uh, on top of that, uh, I found that the keynote time is a good time for interviews in two committees I was serving. Six hours. So uh, I was in the, I think, a committee for new PhD students and also in a committee for an instructor uh, for writing. So I, uh, what I found was, that's when I found this other great invention called the iPad. It doubles up as a communication medium and not just a reading device. So I switch on the uh, Zoom or Skype. But I don't put the video because I don't want to scare off the candidates. <laughs> so I put the audio and put on a bass gruff voice and harangue them. <laughs> and I found, you know, the iPad gives me a new identity that kind of uh, hides all my vulnerability and you know whatever was going on in the room. So you know, I realized the power of objects in reshaping my identity. Prosthetics is a wonderful word. It basically shows how objects become you. They augment you. They're not separate, uh, uh, detached objects. They, they add to a voice, can I say? I also, as I told you earlier, I also reconfigured my environment. I'm here in uh, four walls of the hospital room, but I'm playing with my medication, schedule, writing, uh, style. And I always write on desktop, but uh, now I have to write on the bed, which is unheard of. <laughs> so, uh, with all this, did I tell you uh, this uh, article from Journal of Second Manual Writing? won the best award for the best article for that year. Thank God they didn't know that the revisions were coming from ICUs and cancer wards. They did not have considered me. So in a lot of days, I used objects and ecology to manage uh, the impairment in my body and go in with work. But what I soon realized was the impaired body can itself do a lot of thinking. The body doesn't have to be suppressed or hidden. Let it flourish. 
So that I realized in the second project I undertook, uh, before going for my appendiceal uh, surgery, uh, I was asked by the editors of PQ at the World of Tennessee at uh, Brand Pottery, who had said, you know, the 50th anniversary uh, issue for the PQ is going to be published in 2016, 50th anniversary of the organization, and uh, we'll wonder whether you can do a review of the journal for 50 years, and also the organization for 50 years. And also they said, 8,500 words, 18 pages. So I was kind of chuckling to myself that, yeah, I'll write some stories about a bottle of wine and call it a fancy bird like autoethnography or something. How are you going to review 50 years of uh, progress in uh, 18 pages, right? But here in the hospital, I wised up and what I found was now I can't move. And uh, I have my 10 inch laptop uh, connected to the internet and I can get all the 50 years worth of TQ issues right there on the bed. I can code them for the different theories, different methods, uh, authors. I can cut and paste right there in my uh, draft. I thought of myself as a corpus analyst. Now, always in my life I had thought corpus research is the most boring research. <laughs> I know I'm hurting the feelings of some people here, I'm sorry. But I always thought of myself as the macho ethnographer who loves the deep art of hanging out. You have heard the definition. Ethnography is the deep art of hanging out. But now I can't hang out because you are with stitches all over my body. So I adopted a new method here and uh, through sheer pain and impairment. Uh, and then I was also I think, motivated, it's embodied in this sense. Uh, I thought, if, if the, as the doctors say, I may not be able to work long and this is a very aggressive form of cancer, what about this as my last project? People will say, you know, can you write a review of those years of piece of history and then you fade it away? <laughs> so, not, not a good bad ending. So, I did uh, publish that. I wasn't sure how this new research was coming out because I was fighting with Toxicodon in writing this. But the reviewers were very impressed, to my surprise, both of them. They said things like this. This paper is an impressive achievement. I came to it with a, a bit skeptically, thinking it would never be able to cover what it claims to do. And if it did so, it would be so dense, it would be largely unreadable. Because, you know, reading <laughs> pages for 50 years worth of time. So, uh, that's when I thought, you know, I should let these poor souls know where are these impressive researchers <laughs> coming from? So I don't know, I don't think you can read these acknowledgements. I said, thanks to this project, uh, I coped well with my diagnosis and treatment of cancer in summer and fall 2014s, uh, the time in hospitals for many rounds of surgery and chemotherapy mm -hmm. gave me the patience to do the uh, required research and writing efficiently. I truly, I truly believe it's embodied research. It's my body speaking, body motivating me. So a lot of people have started talking about it, and this is post-colonial scholar Walter Mignola who says, even our racialized body thinks differently and uh, adds to our work. But for uh, disability scholars, it means something special because their body is in pain. So should pain in the body be uh, acknowledged, invited in the work you do? We don't talk about pain in research because that will show us as vulnerable. We want to be always in control in our research. So, uh, Rosemary Gunn Thompson, uh, who is a disfigured, who is a disfigured <coughs> hands, both hands, uh, uh, she engages with feminist theory. And you know, uh, feminist scholars talk about standpoint theory. You might probably translate it as uh, identity as a epistemology. You know, you think uh, uh, producing knowledge from where you stand. And for, disabled, for people who are disabled, they are not standing even. They are either in hospital beds or in crutches or in wheelchairs. So she coins the term sick point theory to play with standpoint theory to acknowledge vulnerability and pain in research. So I don't want to give the impression that uh, I, uh, through just sheer length of my willpower, I transcended uh, my pain, overcame my vulnerability, and started being productive. I was actually a picture of abject helplessness in the hospital. I couldn't even go to the bathroom myself. Uh, and my three P's, you know, you see this nurse checking for activity in the three P's front. You know, any bowel movement, any nice. I had to depend on people. So that's when I realized there are two forms of healthcare workers. Uh, one group says, you know, these are transactional relationships with you. You bring the big brass. I get paid. Uh, I have, we both have our rights and uh, obligations, and we'll uh, engage in this work. That's all of work. 
But there is a people like this, this wonderful mess, uh, who consider this as more than transactional. It was an ethical relationship for her. Uh, basically, what she was uh, doing was, uh, you know, in these sort of situations, she would have conversations with me. Her father had a had colon cancer, and uh, she used to tell me stories about what he was doing at home to get his three piece going. You know, home in Germany, his things he drinks. Uh, now, at this point, I'm in Pittsburgh, UPMC, the world's best place for Akinesia cancer. If you ever, no, no, let me say. <laughs> for Akinesia cancer, you have to go there, so that's hard to say. Let me not say. So she has seen all the patients from all over the world coming here. So she used to tell me stories about how I'm doing in relation to all the people she has met. So she went over and beyond her work to make friends with me, to become personal with me. And I realized the same thing in my research. In the article that I showed you from Peace of Pottery, uh, I used to email my students and uh, they would draw, you know, uh, they, they would go draw these uh, diagrams for me. Actually, they sent it to me in color, but I think you, you know, of all journals now, they need money to paint in color. So, but I, earlier I thought I'd write the article and then add these on, uh, these images to illustrate them. When I got the images, what I found was I was doing a lot of rethinking because I could see certain patterns much more clearly. So it turned out to be a kind of a distributed practice between me writing, their imagination with different colors, different diagrams, and the visual shaping uh, my argument. I had to revise a lot. That's when I started wondering, is it fair uh, to just put my name as the author when uh, this is a case of distributed activity in so many people? So a lot of scholars, and this is uh, Tuvin Siebers, uh, his, uh, uh, his mobility impaired, he had polio all his life, he argues we have to think of the human society as a community of dependent, frail bodies. What a term. How is that? It's an alternative for community of practice, uh, speech community, discourse community. It brings a body in, but body in pain. And then he quickly says, this is not because I'm saying we have to be sorry for the disabled. This is the, the structure of dependence is inherent to all societies. So we'll mull on that. But what I'm going to do is, um, from the hospital, I used to write my cancer diaries to my friends and relatives, all the stories about 3Ds and other body fluids, blood, blood, white cells, red cells, <laughs> you know the story, uh, chemo drugs. But I'm not going to do that today. Hang on, right? Sorry. It's going to be an academic cancer, uh, academic cancer diary for you. Uh, with a lot of my fellow cancer uh, diagnoses, we share a lot of terms, I become socialized into a lot of words like hemicolectomy, but one, one of the other kind of things is Nisi AC, before cancer is uh, after cancer, and how our life changes after the diagnosis. I think there is a busy AC for my academic life. Uh, to begin with, I got interested in disability studies. Now, disability studies is not new in applied linguistics. This is my good friend, Wiley Ravnathan, who published this book in 2009. And this poor lady, she autographed it personally, put it in the mail, it came home. And you know what I did? I just threw it uh, into my bookshelf of unread books because I said, disability studies is for losers. It's not for me. True. Um, and you know what happened after I came from the hospital? <laughs> this is the first book I got out. That's the big started. I was invested now in trying to understand how do people live. And I'm an academic. I'm going to write so many other things. But I started with a book of this nature. By the way, this cover is a kind of interesting thing about me. You know, a lot of disabled people are modeling, and you can see the play with uh, Miss Victoria's Secret here. So uh, this is one way in which the disabled are uh, being empowered. They're using symbolic resources to reconstruct their identity. So with writing his book, I went into a lot of books in our field and rhetoric and composition, and I saw that they are making an important paradigm shift. Uh, for uh, the medical model of disability, is it's a physical problem. It's a deficit that needs to be redressed by the doctor, if possible. But the other orientation to disability uh, that a lot of patricians and uh, applied are interested in is how disability is socially constructed and linguistically constructed. It's a form that uh, makes us either look like second class citizens or empowered like the model there to look at us uh, by and make ourselves differently. So, Wally uh, Ramanan and uh, McFerrin, in their latest second book, uh, they say their book is about how bodies get language. Uh, because, you know, going all the way from uh, Butler and others, you know that the body doesn't have identity written on it. It's a uh, discourse that makes uh, identities like sexual orientation, gender, even race. 
So, uh, this is a, a Norwegian applied linguist who we don't meet here too often, Jan Grew, who is his paraplegic, is in a wheelchair. He talks about how language is central to disability studies and why we in our profession uh, should be concerned uh, about uh, the interconnection between language and disability. From there on, I uh, progressed to uh, fields outside ours uh, in uh, humanities and social sciences, and I found that there's another major shift taking place uh, in the uh, disability move, uh, studies movement. Uh, they would call it critical disability studies, and what these scholars argue is disability studies is not about disability, it's about ability. How do we talk about ability? And from that point of view, it's very central to all of us. So, uh, they identify the ideology of ableism as a central uh, construct that makes us look at people differently. And uh, to sum it up, it's like, ability is the universal norm of being human. If you are disabled, it's a personal, individual problem. It's a deficit. The faster you uh, get out of your disability and act like all of us as able people, the better for you. If not, you're a second-class citizen. Now, what Mr. critical disability scholars argue is, we are all disabled. Disability is the norm, not the ability. Think about it. Uh, we all get old. We will get in there. Uh, we will die. By the way, I will die five or ten years before you, but you will soon follow. So don't plot it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry for me. That's why I keep telling you that all myself. Yeah, again, I don't know about fifteen years earlier. No big deal. Okay, uh, but uh, others put it even nicely. It's not that we are all able. We are all relatively able-bodied, or even better, we are all only relatively able, or even better, we are all relatively abnormal. But it's the uh, ideology of disability that, that makes us not acknowledge that. If you're wearing glasses, do you call yourself visually impaired? There are kinds, but we don't uh, think of ourselves. It's the about that all those other guys in uh, wheelchairs or in crutches as disabled, right? So, uh, now I'm going to extend this to say, um, even the project, the mission for the disabled, is not to transcend disability, but how to embrace disability. Because a lot of them uh, won't have any cure. The doctors always tell me, every three month visit, this thing will always come back. But don't worry, when this comes back, we'll leave you away and get to work quickly. You know, the meeting in part of the journey is supposed to cheer me up. <laughs> but that's what they keep telling me. You know, they, they move from 80-20, it'll come back to 50-50, and that's also supposed to be good news. <laughs> so, the project, the mission for uh, the disabled is uh, not to look for care for a lot of them. Uh, you know, they can't expect that. But how, and that's a project for all of us. How, and that's what all of us are doing. We live with our impairment, uh, except that we don't recognize this as a part of impairment. So, uh, this is a critical question uh, that critical disability studies is asking. How do we define ability? And uh, to make a long story short, uh, uh, I illustrated these four points through my narrative in the opening, right? How I became able in the hospital is first of all, I reconfigured my environment, my uh, work schedule, my uh, time, space, connection, uh, the objects I had. I networked, networked with other people and engaged in distributed practice. I got objects to work with me. Uh, I allowed my mind to think, um, I allowed my body to think when my mind was an oxycodone. So, a lot of scholars have uh, talked about each of those features. I won't go into them, we won't have time. But I want to quickly move on to an example from applied linguistics. Uh, our good friend Chuck Goodwin, uh, who is in UC, uh, UCLA, uh, has talked a lot about his father, Chill, uh, and how they communicate. He has usually uh, uh, done this analysis as an extension of uh, uh, quantization analysis, CA and embodied CA, etc. But there are a lot of implications for uh, ability, a lot of philosophical issues about what it means to be human. So, the Chill had a, 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 some kind of a stroke when he was 65 years old, and he's left with three words yes, no, and. And also a lot of baby sounds like this, we need to. And, uh, but he can communicate fine because, as you can see, uh, he, his gaze points to who he is talking to, who, who needs the new information. He latches on his three words to other people's talk. He uses the objects in his environment by pointing them or holding them uh, to communicate. So we can say one of two things about Chill. Either Chill is disabled and linguistically incompetent. He has only three words. 
and give these others. Or you can say, chill is able if you consider the fact that he's using the body, the environment, and uh, uh, social networks to communicate. So this is going to be a long project, but what I'm going to do at the end of this talk is to tell you we are all like chill. If you define competence differently, I might think you're all oxygen or something. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm going to say that that's uh, an ideology of ableism that's taking us in a different direction. Let's try. It. But all this depends on a big if. If uh, Chuck and his sister Pat collaborate with him, uh, Chill is communicable. If they sit on their haunches and say, Mr. It's your responsibility to, uh, to make yourself understood, we are not going to help you, then Chill will be dead. So, uh, um, one of my favorite rhetoric scholars, Krista Radcliffe, uh, has coined the term uh, uh, rhetorical listening. And what she says is, we teach our students how to speak, but not to listen. Now, talking about here, hearing is a physical activity. Listening is a technical and social activity. How do you collaborate with others? So, uh, we'll uh, see how this, uh, in critical disability studies, is one of the major shifts that took place. The early disability studies talks about the rights of the disabled, how do we can reconfigure the environment to suit them. But critical disability studies talks about ethics. Because what's the point of saying nice things about chill if you're not going to collaborate with it? It's not going to help you. You need to work ethically to make a different brain. Another uh, shift I want to find out is whether Rama and McFerrin talk about how the body is language. Critical disability scholars say the body is languaging. The body is also communicating and thinking. And that's a major shift for me also. Before cancer, I would have called myself a social constructionist. I gave a lot of importance to language and discourse. And they said, I said, language mediates social reality, physical reality, and makes us uh, orientate to it in a particular way. Now I feel I gave too much importance to language. Language works with a lot of other uh, material, uh, bodily resources to communicate. And there's another big shift that I've taken place. I was all for agency in the past. I would say students can be taught to critically think, uh, to engage in critical uh, pedagogy, and they can transform the world. Now I think uh, we are connected to others, the environment, the material world, the objects, and our agency has to be reconsidered that in how we work with them. So let me quickly illustrate how this has made a difference in my thinking. This is the first article I published after I came from Sri Lanka to the United States. In the end of 1994, uh, this article was published in 1996 in written communication. And I was talking about how I felt excluded from publishing networks while I was in Sri Lanka. You know, I didn't have electricity, I didn't have laptops, uh, computers, uh, I didn't have the latest literature. So every time I send an article to a lot of good journals here, they would say, hey, you know, it's, it's an interesting study, but you're not using our language, you're not using our theories. Do you know the last, within the last three months, there have been all these famous articles that appeared? I'll never do that for the next 10 years. So I wanted to ask, you know, is this fair to exclude my research because I don't know your language? Uh, the response was interesting. Well, this is one of the reviews. And what this person is uh, broadly saying is, listen, mister, in order to construct knowledge together, we need to have one conversation. You can't have a conversation in Sri Lanka, and somebody has a conversation in somewhere else, and that's not the way we develop our field. We all have to work together. And so he con concludes, uh, thinking of a key, he concludes by saying, the field doesn't give set aside, you have to compete in the centralization of knowledge for excellence. Come, fight with us. So show you have good research, you have a good idea, you can rate well. You let you think you can participate in knowledge construction. By the way, he or she uh, adopts a nice metaphor from American government election things, uh, movement that I didn't appreciate at that point, now I understand better. Uh, this person is saying, we are not going to say two articles for those two Sri Lankans there, two articles for those Nigerians there, uh, I guess all the rest is for us, right? No set aside here, so I say. So, uh, I kind of approached this very gingerly, and uh, after a lot of revisions, concluded by saying, uh, this essay is not just another by the materially underprivileged seeking set asides, neither is it a plea to all of excellence to provide greater representation for peripheral scholars in set of publications. Rather, this article is an attempt to deconstruct the basis of excellence in publishing scholarship and knowledge construction. I'm doing a kind of similar move that uh, critical disability scholars were making. It's not about making you feel good about the disabled, it's about questioning ability. So, that was good enough to get me published. But now, after cancer, 
I'm thinking of my argument slightly differently. Uh, first of all, I appreciate an important point. That is, uh, you see that the reviewer is trying to tell me, you are excluded not because you are in Sri Lanka, you are a non native speaker of English or anything. You are just not able, mister. Come on, fight with me. Show you are able, show you are excellent. Can you see how the identity of ability is used to marginalize other identities? So a lot of people have started arguing, disability is the mother of all identities. It's so central. It can be used to anyone for sexual orientation, gender, race, to say, it's not about your gender, it's not about your race. You're just not able. So I appreciate this point now, I didn't go here. But I fell into this trap. And what I argued in reverse was, I am able like you. It's just the discourses that are different. It's just the ideologies that are different. If only the discourses were different, you will see how I'm able, Mr. So I think what I did in the college was, in Sri Lanka, I was limited. I was impaired without the resources for research. That actually gave a lot of insights into how knowledge works in a lot of disciplines that has stayed on with me, that has shaped me as a scholar in the field. My experiences trying to publish and do research for Sri Lanka. I should have said, yeah, I was in pain, I was disappointed, I was depressed. But it produced new knowledge. Do you like it? Uh, but there's another uh, a mistake I made, I think. Um, uh, the, at least the reviewer is understanding me as saying, um, give me my rights. Give me a space for my representation in this field. Don't you want the Sri Lankan to publish research in your journal? Uh, I wonder if it would be a better argument to say, it's not about me, it's about us. Do you feel comfortable and happy making knowledge without me joining in the conversation? So, I should have brought more of the uh, relational ethics there. Uh, so, in the show, the Tiger Mom wrote an interesting op-ed in, uh, uh, in The Guardian recently. She said, after about 50 years of identity politics, we are worse off than ever. We are polarized in the United States, divided in Europe, everywhere. And what went wrong? I think one thing that went wrong is we didn't develop an ethic of coexistence. We are all trapped in our ghettos, let I say, uh, of our own communities, own identities, including my neighbors in Pennsylvania who are working in coal mines and doing a lot of other things. They also want their rights and identity. We have to really learn how to live together. But as I think more about coexistence, relationality, how my identity is connected with people and things, I'm also finding this is what people in South Asia said thousands of years ago. I ran away from all this in order to satisfy that reviewer and show that I'm good in the Western forms of thinking. Uh, so this is uh, A. Mizori, uh, Native American feminist scholar, who says, how ironic it is, we are now cheering post-humanism and new materialism, actor network theory, etc. when people uh, in her community articulated these things millennia ago. So it was kind of a deja vu for me. Uh, so, the disabled identity it just adds something new to what I already had as a multilingual, non native Asian. It reconfigured my identities, repositioned me in the academic uh, community. So, thank God I came to this realization through stays in hospital wards and ICUs. It's my sit point thinking. But all the heroes that are mine that I quoted before, all of them are disabled in some form. And, uh, uh, Toby Seaver, who was in Ann Arbor and who passed away uh, about two or three years ago, uh, says when the disabled in engage in scholarship, it's not stories, they are theories, actually critical theories. Because from their wheelchair or crutches, they are developing a perspective into the world that's very critical of what's going on. So that's why I'm kind of being um, obsessed with cancers and that galleries these days, because from the age of mortality, uh, people are rethinking a lot of things, and you have created these famous cancer diaries in the context, what metaphors and language, uh, or the law and upon activism, uh, and of course, Jenny Desky recently about creative writing and the life of a writer. But there's an everydayness, everydayness to this genre. It's not only these famous people who write like this, there are ordinary people who are writing their diaries, and I go to Karen Bridge, uh, free registration. Uh, and I read uh, the stories and blogs about four or five people. Let me quickly, uh, I want to do some data analysis about the new research I'm doing after cancer, but I want to tell you the story of John Rowe. I met John uh, in Pennsylvania, in, in, uh, when I moved there in 2007 fall. Uh, John and himself moved from England. 
and he said, well, I'm living in a church, and he said, well, you know, you might take time to adjust to the, a new environment, and if you want to talk, come over to my office. So I, on Wednesdays at noon, I walked to McAllister building, uh, where the Matthew Department is, and uh, we met and did what Christians do, read the scripture, meditated, reflected, prayed. But after a while, I thought, hey, Penn State is treating me nice. You know, my department has given me so many awards. I'm a star. I know I don't need John's prayers anymore. I was wrong. So last fall, uh, I did one of my annual rituals, fall rituals, which is on a Sunday afternoon after church, I need to make a nice walk in the Penn State Alvarita. It's dressed gloriously for with uh, fall foliage and fall colors. And who do I, I see walking in front of me on crutches? what John wrote. We got into talking and we found that we were both diagnosed with cancer at the same time, spring of 2014. And uh, unfortunately for him, it returned two years later. So before he hobbled on, uh, John told me, okay, now both of us are in the club, nobody wants to join. And went away. I quickly connected with him and started reading his lungs. And this is on October 1st. By the way, it's very personal. And I asked John for permission to show this to you. But what I see is it's illustrating the same points I just made all along. First of all, look at his faith and courage and good humor. Although he's announcing we have stopped treatment, uh, we're going for uh, hospice care, palliative care. He uses the metaphor of hide and seek to say, say, to say cancer is not to me, ready or not. And then, uh, but he goes on to say, hospice care or palliative care is not giving up. It is not the end this night. Just just, uh, it's not just let nature take its course. Hospital scale focuses on living your life, best life now. How can somebody say that? Living your best life now? If you read the rest, what you need to find is he is reconfiguring his ecology, his environment, to suit his body. So what this uh, as well as I said is uh, disability is actually a gap between the environment and you. If you change that gap, you know, the ecology of life returns. So as a proof of this, John is still intellectually active. So here's another uh, blog titled Points of Inflection. Point of Inflection is the point at which an equation changes uh, character or you know, equation. So he is using this as a, an, a metaphor for the way the world changes when we human beings are no longer physically small disturbance on the surface of nature, but have become the main event. You know what he's doing, right? He's talking about that type of thing. And he has started a new project, a new book that he started working on with three or two of his graduate students, titled Map for Sustainability. So I started interviewing him by email and asked, you know, what about this new project you started, uh, started thinking? And he said, I already felt a calling for sustainability work before the diagnosis, knowing that I had cancer confirmed the sense of calling and pushed me to bring the book to fruition. Especially I, after I learned uh, that I had metastatic disease and he was going to die relatively soon. I selfishly pray that I'd like to hold a printed copy in my hands, but uh, that doesn't feel like me now. I think this is embodiment in the sense of uh, urgency and motivation to get this work done. But it gets better. As he goes further, he says, the cancer growth metaphor is so obvious and so thought-provoking, both at once, that my health situation certainly energized my work on the book and also confirmed the feeling that this was, in some sense, my legacy project. And he has explained these two metaphors in other places. Just as in cancer, bad cells overtake good cells in the environment, pollution is doing uh, damage. And just as there is unrestricted, unrestrained growth because of patterns and materials, and there's a lot about that, we are destroying nature. So uh, this is this sit point thinking, inspired all by all these great uh, scholars that I see before me, I want to conclude by offering my sit point thinking to our field. A lot of my research lately has been making me rethink confidence. If you look carefully, the notion of confidence is informed through and through with an ideology of realism. Our project as teachers and scholars is to arm our students with the mastery of finite grammatical knowledge that so that they can produce infinite sentences in infinite contexts in performance. That is unsustainable. Like Jan Bernard and others have said, the, ha the high mark, the, ha uh, the hallmark of globalization, mobility, etc., is unpredictability. So you want your students with your knowledge and they're having a conversation, and in walks a Sri Lankan with this weird accent. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Your knowledge is not enough for you. You need other resources. Others have critiqued uh, 
competence for other reasons. And what uh, Alison Pitch says is, the notion of competence, the mastery, mastery of competence, uh, the uh, mastery of grammatical knowledge, makes us ignore a lot of other capabilities we need for communication and interaction. So she has a lot of interesting stories here. One of them is she was adopting a daughter from Ethiopia, and the British Home Office declined or rejected the, the, uh, the appeal for asylum. Uh, so she was going to be uh, sent back. Here she is. She doesn't know Amharic like her daughter. The daughter doesn't know English. And how are they negotiating this very stressful situation? There was communication beyond words. And uh, so what she goes on to talk about in this article is the strength of competency concept makes us ignore a lot of other capabilities and resources. She uses the word uh, capability here, capability there, to say there are a lot of other uh, resources uh, that are required for competence. She gives you a sense in this quotation, corporeality of address, uh, capability of patience, uh, observation, sensory dimensions, we lose focus on all those kinds of things. She prefers capability as an alternative for competence. Uh, this is almost the same, uh, so it, it does make a difference to say I'm capable of doing something rather than I'm competent in doing something, right? I'm capable of something here, not there. I'm capable of this, but not you. You might be capable of other things. It's similar to the other move I made earlier in one of the slides. I said not disabled, but differently able. Unfortunately, for critical disability studies, this shift is not enough. Both disabled to differently able and competence to capability still focus on the individual. It's about me. But they should say it's not about me. It's about the social networks, the ecological resources. How do I how do we situate ourselves in that? So these days I'm thinking up against it, <laughs> uh, that uh, the a better available might be in placement. I won't go through that. But basically what it means is how we are uh, attuned, or we communicate in attunement with social networks and material uh, uh, networks in which we are placed. But I think the big fear all of us would have is where is human agency, where is me, am I lost in all these resources? It doesn't have to be. So um, what I did is when I was in the hospital, within the four walls of the hospital with sutures all over my body, I repositioned myself in a way to my advantage to be productive. Somebody else could have positioned themselves not to be productive. It's a choice. So repositioning is good enough for me as agency. That's all we can expect. In the, in the context of all the resources around us, how do we situate ourselves? So, uh, let me conclude with the research that I'm doing these days. Uh, I'm doing a lot of uh, observations and interviews with international STEM scholars. And a lot of them chuckle as they tell me, I'm not good in English. But they are able to do it confidently, sometimes cynically, because they know they are successful because how they have placed themselves in a lot of other resources that are available to them. But I'm going to tell you the story of Ji Hoon. He's from South Korea. Uh, he did all his uh, academic work, including his PhD in South Korea. So he's a postdoc in microbiology at Penn State. So this is the first time he's in an English dominant environment. And he, so he's unlike a lot of other international science scholars I talked to, in being much more differential and diffident. And he talks about, I'm nervous when I go to conferences. I wish I had more spoken language. So, uh, you know, he thinks that uh, he's not good. He needs to work hard. So, uh, after cancer, I'm also treating my research subjects, a word that I've stopped using, as full-bodied individuals. And I'm beginning to get to know them as people. And there are a lot of other vulnerabilities that uh, Jeevan faces. One of them is living from grunt to grunt. And this is a story where he tells how his EI was putting pressure on him to finish an article, <coughs> send it for publication, so that they can review the grant or write a nice report saying that how successful he was. And he uses the word, you might say it's bad English, uh, this experience could affect my destiny, but it's profoundly true. If they don't get the grant, he has to pack off back to his home country with his wife and son, and it'll be a different life thereafter. Um, on top of that, uh, his uh, wife has been fighting depression for about uh, six or seven years. So he has to take care of the family, she's unable to do anything. Uh, and also his 10 year old son. On top of that, he's moonlighting as a translator. He, on the internet, he gets essays from South Korea and Korean, and he translates it in English, sends it back. So the obvious question is how do you work? How are you productive? 
And what he said is, actually, all this anxiety and all this pressure has made me schedule my work in a very efficient way. I would look at the priorities more clearly. And uh, this is a nice narrative. I played wish I could play the audio, but I won't have time. And so he speaks very slowly. It's a nice story about how he did a piece of uh, uh, research and experiment and sent the details, the, the steps, uh, to their collaborators in the University of Virginia. And they followed the same steps, but they couldn't find the results. So they were suspecting that you know this, this research is not valid. But they came to Penn State, and he did the research. And this is priceless. They said, they saw him uh, coming up with the conclusion, and one of them said, OK, I got it. That's a human factor. You know, what they're saying is, Jim doing the research is different from them doing the research in uh, University of Virginia. That's, that's very interesting insight. So is it this sit point thinking, this pressure? Actually, that's what he goes on to talk about. You know, he doesn't give up. He's very persistent because of the pressures he has. So he's also using his environment in very uh, effective ways. Uh, halfway through some of the interviews, he used the uh, analogy of recipe, cooking. His research is like cooking. Just as in cooking, you have a recipe. He has a recipe for his uh, studies, his uh, research. And what he says, I write my recipe uh, before the end of the day, put it on the uh, desk behind me so that next morning when I come, I know what to cook. You know, it's making an intuition. But then he goes on to also say uh, how the, he has a lot of chemicals that uh, he uses. They come in small labels. He changed the labels to big letters and also arranged it in a particular way in the shelf behind him so that it's convenient for his research. One of the things he says is he has to prepare a gel before he does this uh, research in, on DNA. But uh, he found through a lot of research that this gel is available. He doesn't have to do it for like one day or two days. So he started using it and made a special case with his PI to buy it. It transformed this research. So the obvious question I had for him is, we have a state-of-the-art millennial complex in our university. I said, would you like to go there? Because it would make you more efficient. He said, no, because this ecology has been shaped for my purposes. I'd rather be here rather than go to the state-of-the-art place. So he also uses objects very effectively. And I'm going to illustrate it through the most uh, unexpected example writing as an object. So what he's doing is, this is he's the lead author in this, I mean, first author in this article. And uh, I have actually summarized, I mean, tried to bring in one screen, the first, the three pages of his first draft. You can see it, not a problem. But all that I want to show is, if this is his first draft, it shows something about his writing process. What he does is he has all these titles, like introduction, results, discussion, materials and methods, acknowledgments, references. And first, he starts writing uh, methods and materials, partly because it's readily available. It's from another paper from their team, another big dog that could be something there. Yeah. It's making minor modification. You might call this a kind of a product oriented writing, but I'm going to say good things about this writing, uh, much to the chagrin of writing scholars. Uh, so, one of the things is, uh, when they, uh, although he's writing as if he is fixing. Uh, verbal resources in particular places of the text, it's generating a lot of thinking. So in this case, when they put all this information, his PI is saying, uh, this needs cleaning up. Uh, should we really need this place here? I'm sorry, you can't see it over there. And what Jayun says is, this is what these other team did in this paper. These are the steps. So can you see a guy who says, I'm bad in English, fighting back with his PI? The object uh, gives him the confidence to talk back. Uh, or here, uh, another of their teammates, an uh, Indian um, chemical, you know, associate professor, says, I don't think uh, this information belongs here. And he says, this is the format of plant physiology. The paper, you know, you know that he's using the format, the template. So he's writing that. And then uh, when they see their information put together in their particular places, you know, this is the materials and other space, uh, the PI has questions about certain uh, connections that they have, you know, how the visuals and the description go together. He's saying, I'm doing this research. I will do this research again. You know, what's happening is, it's not a case of research comes first and writing comes later. Writing as an artifact comes first and research sometimes follows after that. So there's still a lot of re you know, generation of new thinking, new work going on. So I could have talked about uh, how uh, this uh, PI from South Korea works with 
uh, if you saw, saw the authorial page, there are people from Sweden, uh, from other universities in the United States, and Australia. How do these people work together? I think in the last year's uh, uh, plenary, I talked about the networking that is going on, the social practice. But I want to talk about something, I, I want to talk about the way they work in relation to the uh, more difficult, more challenging situation. How do they talk together in, as a social practice? So, um, what is complicated about this is, while Jim says he's bad in English, he has to actually talk with uh, EI who is Anglo-American, uh, uh, graduate student from Ireland, and another uh, postdoc uh, from China. There's an interesting story here, and I sent the IRB to the whole team and said, I want to videotape you, and you know, okay, you know, he is our focal participant, Jim, but you will be all in the video. But the PI said, why are they studying you? You are not bad in English. Maybe the Chinese we are shaking more recently. So keep that in mind. How is it possible that a research person who says I'm bad in English can be treated as good in English by his peer? I'm going to just illustrate their, the way they work together. So there seems to be something about their language ideology. And what Jimun says is, we have some common things, like a goal. It helps in a lot of ways. It helps them unpack what is unintelligible. But more importantly, it makes them work together. You need the other person. So you need to uh, work with them. He goes on to say, um, there might be certain sources of miscommunication, but it is sufficient. We are not perfect, but it's enough. How is that for a language ideology? It's very pragmatic, very functional. Uh, do you have problems in understanding? Sometimes I have a problem, but I know what she meant. Is extrasensory perception allowed in applied linguistics? You know, the words might be wrong, different, but I can give the meaning, I can include the meaning. I wish I could play it, but I think I'm running out of time, the audio at least to get it twice. But I do think I would play this, uh, how they work as a team. And um, I have multiple uh, clips here, I won't show all of them, but I just, I'll just play maybe one or two of them. I just want you to see, uh, first of all, how his gestures, uh, and the uh, monitor, they always see it in front of the monitor and they're getting up all their photographs from their results. Uh, the monitor uh, helped uh, in unpacking language. So a person like Chiro can still be communicable because there are a lot of other resources. But more importantly, like Chuck and Pat, um, Nick is collaborating, he's listening, he's working. So watch uh, both of them. This is the so this is series from one to seventeen. So one is actually the same for the um, each gel to make like some like internal control. So one is so cell extract and then non-membrane protein membrane and then flow through and the washing step and then this illusion uh, and then concentration and then this concentrated one was. Um, we um, they incubated with uh, is 10 concentrated and 9 is just the illusion? 9 and 10 10 is actually concentrated one but the, it's not but the volume yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. so then the whole thing was incubated again then, then this is flowed through yeah. after yeah. yeah so one thing to see is he's always using gestures accompanying his talk and it helps more than him first of all it does help him because as you can see when he can't find the word re-incubated, he kind of uses this email like that. And some of our brilliant graduate students are trying the word thinking with your hands. Adam Ben Kampanov might be here. Uh, he says how sometimes gestures uh, help you to find the word or clarify your ideas. But more than that, uh, there are turn after turn where uh, Jay Boon is unable to finish his sentence. Nick's com Nick comes to the rescue. Because he knows uh, from the context, from the gestures, from the visuals, uh, what uh, Jimin is trying to say. I, I have uh, a lot of other uh, 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 clips where I can show. He's not just doing a deficit thing, giving a word he wants, but actually summing up the conversation. Uh, I think people, uh, I think the gist formulation is what uh, see people call it. That he listens to the whole conversation and gives him a word, okay, this is what's going on. Sometimes there's upshot, whereas he describes a particular uh, series of events and says, oh, the implications are this. So he completes the term not just by giving a word, but more than that, actually uh, listening actively to carry on the conversation. Yeah. And then the washing 
full washing, and then this is illusion, and then this is concentrated. So yeah. this is his sitting and body. So his sitting and body actually. That's right. Yes. Right. So. This was his sitting and body. Yeah, both. Yeah, both his sitting and body. Somehow this one is very bad. Or dirty, Logic. but they, but they, you see the band is actually there. Are some like a smaller band is still there, like this. It's more band. Right. This. So, <laughs> I, uh, uh, well, one of the things I also want to show is there's a lot of uh, nice diseases like this, that. That's fine, right? You know why? We are strong on the monitor. You don't, and also the technical terms like history. That's what he uses. Uh, here's another way of phrase where uh, Nick uh, rephrases what he said. He says, like this, and uh, spent about a couple of turns describing a process, and he says, like anybody, more of anybody. So he's giving a uh, rephrasing it in the new term. Okay, I want to come to this. Uh, as I listen to this, um, listen to what Chikun um, uh, is doing, uh, I initially thought that uh, science scholars look like that, not us in the arts. I write alone, is what I thought. That's what, this is me talking in the tape about this comparison very early in the conversation. Uh, but that's wrong, because I told everyone on the early slides uh, from the hospital, I was engaged in distributed practice. But the graduate students are sitting in their graphs and the diagrams. Just the visuals made me think differently. So I then uh, turned, and this is, I wish, I wish I could show you the this is the very end of the conversation. I've changed my thinking about this. And I'm saying, maybe we all like that. And uh, what I, this is like a, uh, it's about last uh, December. It looks like I'm brainstorming for this talk. Because what I'm doing is, I'm actually telling you, you know, like how you do your, handle your objects and ecology, that's what I did in the hospital. So I don't know if you want to, to just see. Yeah, because I think in our field, and probably in yours also, everybody values efficiency, you know, just get the results quickly. So I'm going to say, we're forgetting a lot of other things like uh, pain and suffering and insecurity and um, ethics, you know, being, you know, loving people, loving, uh, you know, I think one of the things is uh, maybe because I care for this, our students and uh, the communities we serve, uh, I want to do things differently, better. So so that's a theme I'm thinking of. So I was thinking, uh, you know, uh, in addition to talking about myself, uh, I can show how in the research I do also, like, you know, case, um, there are also similar situations. You know, one of the other things I'm going to show is um, uh, even when we are weak, uh, it's not about us, it's about how we shape our environment. So I was thinking in my, even the hospital, you know, I would, I can't move when I was in surgery, but I have a small computer laptop. <laughs> so I was doing a lot of work and I was, uh, I was arranging a lot of things in my environment. <laughs> like, you know, they give me pain medication. Yeah. If I take it, I'll sleep. So what I do is whenever they come in the daytime and ask me, are you in pain? I said, no, I'm not in pain. <laughs> but when they come in nighttime, so yeah, I'm in pain. <laughs> because I was kind of organizing my day. Okay. You know, I sleep well in the night yeah. and then in the daytime I'm working. <laughs> so I was kind of arranging my <laughs> uh, environment to get rid of some... These are, but these themes are coming up. What they're saying is earlier in all our fields, people said, you know, knowledge is knowledge, science is science. We don't take into account the human factor, the social factor, ecology, environment. So I'm going to kind of illustrate from my example. Uh, but uh, I was also thinking, you know, when I read your, how your um, objects, resources, uh, they help scientists in similar ways. So that's what I was kind of thinking. I love this book, a lot about my antics in the hospital. It looks like uh, this one of the being a student, uh, what anxiety is here uh, in order to keep working. Um, so, uh, but you might say, uh, it looks like I'm, if that is update, I'm changing these views on language and communication. That's outrageous, I think. You might scold me for that. A man says, I'm bad in English, and I'm telling you, that's not the issue. We are both using ecology, objects, social networking to communicate with Now, there goes our job. <laughs> He's not going to come for English classes anymore. But even worse, the researcher starts thinking differently. He's changing my understanding of what communication means, what competence means in applied linguistics. Is shaped by a state scholar? You're going to say, uh -huh, this is going too far. All that I can say in my favor is, uh, oh, um, I'm maybe I am doing a different kind of applied linguistics. 
let me call it embodied applied linguistics. Um, Kira Hall and uh, Mary Buchholz wrote an article titled, titled Embodying Sociolinguistics, and they are the first two bullet points in their article. I added the last four based on critical research studies and my experiences. Uh, basically, uh, I'm thinking of uh, research as an engagement of full body people engaging with others with body, changing our life circumstances. So I do feel inspired all the time when I come off an interview with uh, Jim. Uh, so very appropriately, we meet on Sundays. Uh, it's a day for rest and reflection. The reason is that uh, he does research for all six days and he doesn't want me to come in here close to his lab. But he said, Sundays at 5 o'clock, um, uh, if you want, you can come to uh, Wingman's. That's where we meet in the country. <laughs> so uh, recently, uh, I was uh, finishing a conversation with him. And uh, I said good night, and um, I just remembered my wife wanted me to uh, bring some groceries from Raymond's. I started walking, and uh, I was uh, thinking to myself, uh, I actually have my my uh, tape recorder that I take with me. I was kind of clutching it closely because I said, 90 minutes of wonderful stuff. I can't wait to go home and listen. If I got everything. I can't uh, wait to transcribe it. But then my heart sang. Because the next day, Monday, I had my periodic uh, MRIs and uh, CAT scans. So I said, if they find cancer, all this is going to go to waste. <laughs> but then I kept on walking through the vegetable aisles in Wigman's, and then I thought, it's not the transcription and writing on a impact, high impact like the article, uh, journal that counts. It's this 90 minutes with this guy. And what did we do? Two vulnerable human beings created a community of frail bodies as Tobin would say, out of this community, we created new knowledge about how science works, how communication works. We created enough meta-knowledge of how each of us uses objects, ecological resources in our favor. We inspired each other to keep moving despite our frailties. So when I thought like that, I said, hell, moments like this are so rich, they are worth living however short my life. But even better, when I thought like that, I forgot all about the next day's uh, CT scans and uh, MRIs. I just told myself a word uh, that I usually don't use in public. It's a new word. I learned it only after I migrated to the United States. But on this occasion, I said to myself, fuck cancer. <laughs>